So look, the, um, the topic of the surveillance state was one that I, I wrestled with a little bit because in a way there's a lot written about what it is. Um, there's a lit in terms of what's being gathered and how it's being used. I guess there's a little bit less in the discussion about why it exists and what purpose it serves. And, and I think it's an area where I don't necessarily have all the answers, but I think it's one that unless we're going, we aren't going to find a fix for it, we, but we aren't going to have to find a way to learn how to live with it and manage it. And, um, and I'll, I'll get to that in the talk. And, and I think, you know, and one of the areas of this space too is that I've, I've noticed that, you know, we run the risk of, you know, um, basically <laughs> run the death by facts about every kind of technology. And so what I really wanted to do in this, in this talk was not necessarily to drown you in facts, but rather trying to provide a framework for the way you might want to consider the role of the actions and the role of the, uh, um, the surveillance state. So what do I mean by it? Um, and to that extent, I, I, I've struggled with most definitions that are quite vague and, um, and, and quite descriptive. Um, but before I do that, I think there's a couple of principles, and I guess I come at this from my, my basis really in data ethics and data governance, um, that you've really got to start a meaningful discussion about, in my mind, because a lot of the discussion around data has a lot of baggage. People will say that's bad data or that's good. Um, but the principle I, take, I really begin with is that data, whether it's surveillance or otherwise, is actually ethically inert. And it doesn't have any intrinsic value. Um, the value that it, it is ascribed to it, good, good, bad or indifferent, is actually attributable to how you use it, not to the data itself. Um, and I think that's a really important thing in mind in the sense that it really, when it comes down to ethics, and I'll cover some of that as well, is, is how you assess, you know, is this fit for purpose, what are the consequences and what are the regulatory issues associated with it. And that really comes into the second principle is that data without purpose is effectively meaningless. It's essentially an answer without a question or an answer looking for a question. And I say that because I think, as I say, we get caught up into this sort of good and bad, black and white, it's almost a false binary around some of these discussions. And I, and I think if we're going to talk about the surveillance state and the surveillance economy, then we need to sort of be pretty clear that the sorts of data that's collected, whether it's on a CCTV or, or a facial recognition, it's the context in which it's used that determines uh, its, its goodness or badness, if, if for want of a better expression. Um, and so, you know, the CCTV thing is quite an interesting one in the sense that, you know, 10 years, that was a 10 year ago issue, we were putting CCTVs around, um, but that issue has now morphed in the sense that at that stage we were just pulling um, effectively video stuff and because it was, you know, big, it took up a lot of storage, we didn't keep it for that long and, and it was really about playing the video back, you know, you see them in those police procedurals where they sort of sit by the screen watching, you know, for the, you know, for the sort of the the bad person to kind of walk across the screen. Um, but what sort of happened is that in the last few years, all of that video data has now collided effectively with algorithms. And it's huge amounts of data plus algorithms creates facial recognition. It's really, a, it's, and so all of those cameras that were put out there weren't put out there for the purposes of facial recognition. They were put out there for a completely different purpose. But now that they're out there, you know, the purpose changes. So how does the consideration around what does that mean and why we use it? And, and what tends to happen is that in, in, certainly in the local government context where a lot of these things are rolled out, those consequences haven't been thought about, much less the governance issues associated with them. And in fact, I would, I'll digress a little bit because it, it, a year or so ago, the Victoria Auditor General actually did a survey of, you know, basically did an audit of, I think it was about 15 um, councils around Victoria on their use of CCTV. So this is not facial recognition, this is just the, the capture of images. And what they actually found was all but one of them um, effectively had no governance policy around it. Um, and most of them basically didn't have any security around how to manage that. They simply went ahead, in a sense, for all the right intentions, we want to stop crime, let's put cameras out there, but not put in place in what I would call the governance principles to actually manage that. And that's not a technical problem, that's a that's an institution, that's a governance issue. And to some extent, that's the piece that's missing in a lot of this debate about the, the surveillance state. Um, the other thing I'd like to really come across from a, um, I guess it's the, the ethical perspective again, is, is to really have three ethical lenses to look at this. And for those who have been ethics, it's probably no surprise. But 
but I think in, in any of our conversations, there's really three things we need to think about. One is that from a virtue ethics point of view, it's really with whatever we're doing with surveillance information or, or using it, what are the intrinsic values, what's the intrinsic character that we have associated with its use? So that, those could be around, you know, whether it's to do with social justice, equity, um, um, autonomy, you know, integrity, all those sort of things, you know, fairness. And so, you know, they guide, in a sense, why we, why do we want to do this in the first place? You know, that equally might be around that, that, that purpose-based project. It might, it might be a notion about national security. And so it's the balance of those, those values and principles that almost becomes a starting point. And then the next, really, the next lens, which is the one that tends to dominate the discussion, is really what I call the, the rules lens, which is the lens of, um, you know, laws, regulations and procedures. And, you know, so the idea of our privacy, our data protection, you know, our fundamental, you know, human rights type issues, which um, Maura will cover in a little bit more detail. Um, and the tendency is we think those are going to be the protective layer for us, but they're not. I mean, our, our privacy legislation is, is profoundly weak. We have no Bill of Rights um, and we're sailing into a digital, you know, basically economy and, a, and an information economy basically without any of those protections and, and really with little understanding as individuals or society about how vulnerable that is for us. And, and really the final one, and to me the most important lens to look at is the what I call the consequential lens, which is that you know, what, are the, what are the results and consequences of what we do? So if you look at something like robo-debt as a, well, I guess it's a surveillance, you know, we've collected information about your tax and your welfare benefits and we crunch them together and determine that you're, you owe us money, um, right, you know, with a 20% with a, with a failure rate, I might add. Um, but, you know, the government would say that ethically we've actually broken no rules, so it must be okay. You know, and from a virtue, you know, we're, we're doing the right thing because it's all about fairness. We don't want, you know, we don't want to be paying people that don't deserve the money. So what could be fairer than that? But, but equally, you could say there's another character rule around, you know, equity and, uh, uh, you know, and compassion and social justice associated with it. Um, and I guess the other side is the, the consequential issues, and that really relates to the fact that you know, in the process of embarking on this program, did we consider all the impacts? Did we consider the fact that people would be potentially traumatised by this? Um, the people that were but very little agency, um, that were potentially, well, in most cases, marginalised and vulnerable, that this would have um, a profound <coughs> impact? And, and then what kind of steps could, would we take to sort of mitigate those impacts? And, and those things clearly didn't happen. So let me get to my definition, which is a fairly simple one. That, and it's really that the surveillance state is the capture and use of surveilled data about individuals and groups by the state for the purposes of prosecuting the state's political, policy, legislative and regulatory objectives. Um, and I add the word groups in here because the surveillance state is not just about its action on us as individuals, as citizens. Um, but in, in some ways, even more significantly, it's, it's the way that the state acts upon groups that are identified, whether those are groups based on ethnicity, ethnicity yes, um, basically on uh, in, in religion, uh, socioeconomic, you know, sexuality, a whole range of backgrounds, um, whether that's done intentionally or otherwise. So what does the surveillance data look like? And so again, what I don't necessarily want to do is go into every piece of technology. But if you consider that surveillance, um, whether it's done in a commercial or government or whatever sense, is really focused on us as individuals and therefore our, our identity or what we identify as. Um, and there are essentially four dimensions to think about. The first one is a descriptive one. It's my demographics, my appearance, you know, how tall I am, where I live, um, all of those sort of, in a sense, quite physical things. Um, the second dimension is a relational one. So you can, so go back to the first, you can define me by what you can describe me as. You can identify me now as also by my relationships. So these are my relationships with others. So that might be my social relationships, my professional ones, my family relationships. Um, some of those, you know, in terms of marital and family relationships, may be also part of my descriptive um, identity. Um, 
But in a surveillance state, it's certainly more than just simply the physical. So the, in a sense, our so in a digital world, our social relationships through social media um, and our linkages um, with other people can actually be tracked very easily. And they tell us, in a sense, they say a lot about who we are and what we believe in. The third one is, is behavioural. So this is really about tracking my, my behaviours, my movements, um, my purchasing behaviour at one level. It could be my, my job hardening activities if I'm, if I'm doing it as part of a, a welfare, a welfare um, requirement. My interactions with an agency, which could be um, welfare, health, education, the police. Um, and the important thing about the behavioural side of things is that each behaviour of itself isn't significant, but that behaviour over time forms a pattern that is unique. It's like a fingerprint. And the fourth piece is, is really uh, what I'd call intentional. You can identify me by my intentions. So these could be expressed or implied. So these, you know, my, my voting preferences, my group associations. So let's have a look at how they're gathered. And so if I use the four um, dimensions above, um, you can be quickly begin to see how each of those can be pulled together in, in, a, in a surveillance context. Our descriptive data is obviously the, is most of inter interactions with the state, you know, electoral rolls, tax file information, welfare information, health education. Um, and they're most often also the, the focus of privacy protections, but it's also around the discussions around de-identification and re-identification issues. But the big issue here within this space that's now really arri you know, really in the last few years is the notion of facial recognition. So it's a piece of descriptive data. It's probably the most personal descriptive part data we have, which is you know, how we look. Um, and, it's the, and it's the state's appropriation of, the, of it. And, uh, and if you're not already aware, there's some legislation which has now, I think, gone through its, it might be its second reading. Um, and it's basically a, to establish a multi-agency facial recognition database, which, you know, which I think rather unfortunately the um, government ref refers to as the capability, which yeah. really kind of sounds terrible. Um, <laughs> you know, but you know that's about to go, that's about to be legislated, and there's been no pushback or opposition at all. You know, nobody wants to stand in the way of what any that could be perceived to be a national security issue, r regardless of the consequences. Um, when it comes to relational data, as I mentioned, it's partly descriptive insofar as it may, we, we could be defined by household, family or work status. But in a digital surveillance context, it's our social networks, the interest groups we identify with and interact with um, that really give rise for some concern, particularly when they're combined with our behavioural intentional data um, and, used, and used, as we've seen in the, sort of the case of, say, Cambridge Analytica, as a basis for manipulating our behaviour. Behavioural data is another big surveillance issue because our behaviours over time, as I mentioned, creates a unique fingerprint. Um, in other words, we can uniquely be identified, re-identified and surveilled um, without actually knowing our names. So my travel patterns identify where I live, where I work, how I travel to get there, as we saw from uh, the uh, re-identification example that, was, um, that basically showed using the my, key, the, the my key data in a Twitter identifying one of our politicians. Um, but I think that, you know, the key thing here is that my one travel pattern for a day means nothing, but my travel pattern for a year is a unique fingerprint. Only I have that and nobody else has that. And you only need to combine that with, you know, a tweet or an Instagram picture um, and you, you found me. Intentional data um, is another one because in a sense it's... Uh, I mean, this one, in a way, is, also, is almost quite creepy because it's, um, you know, it's an inf it's in inference based in the sense that yes, I may express, I may, you know, um, explicitly express my intentions that I want to do this, but the reality is most intentional data is gleaned through the use of algorithms that basically try and predict what I may do next, um, and uh, you know, when we see it probably at the most onerous end, where in the U.S. there's been attempts to. Well, not attempts. They're actually using um, using data to um, help drive sentencing. So, putting in behavioural information and using giving that to judges to determine how long a, a sentence should be. And of course, you know what's what what's been discovered in a lot of this stuff is that a) it's not transparent, and b) 
the inherent bias in the data just causes the, the discrimination to be amplified even more, mainly because that's, it's, it's just inferring from past behaviour that it's future behaviour. Um, but it's a, you know, it in a surveillance state becomes, you know, in a sense, quite concerning because um, it also becomes a means of testing influence. So, you know, if I apply a certain amount of treatments through the way we communicate, has it influenced behaviour? You know, can I put something in to influence, influence future behaviour in terms of how you might vote, how you might think about a particular issue? And of course, we certainly see in China where there's, they've taken that notion in almost in minority port, report style to be able to, um, you know, in a sense, um, surveil you on the basis of your propensity to commit a crime in future. Um, so this kind of data, in a way, is not, well, it's not limited to the state. And the state certainly didn't invent it. Um, you know, it's, it's really, to situate the idea of the, su the surveillance state, you need to really see it in the context of um, surveillance capitalism, of which, of so information capitalism, I should add, of which surveillance capitalism, which is a term coined by, coined by Sashana Zuboff, um, is a manifestation. And the methods and tools really pioneered by the two biggest actors, Google and Facebook, is really where in a way that, that, that's heralded this, this new form of capitalism. And it's not to say there haven't been others, and Uber and Twitter and, and, and certainly a lot of the Chinese organisations are appropriating that type of capability. Um, but in, in the end, we have two, com two companies that collectively control about 80% of the world's digital marketing. Now, if that was any other industry, you'd have antitrust <laughs> monopoly, you know, government screaming monopoly. Um, but um, they have an immense power and they have an immense amount of data which allows them to drive an a, a immense amount of insight or surveillance, if you will. Um, and in a way, it's, that's where governments have begun to find, I guess, the know-how or appropriating that in, a, you know, in, a, uh, in, a, in the context of the state. So then, if you want to situate the surveillance state, we really need to understand how it fits into this information capitalist model. And, and to do that, um, I really wanted to quote a, it was again a piece I, I saw Shoshana Zuboff actually talk about in a paper, but she quoted a um, Hungarian early 20th century economist, uh, uh, Karl Polyani, who, who said that industrial capitalism relied on three fictions. One, that human life is subordinated to labor, that nature is subordinated to real estate, and that the exchange of value is subordinated to money. And, and in a way, if you, you know, I guess from a Fabian context, that's the industrial world that gives rise to the labour movement. So in a sense, that asymmetry between um, you know, individuals with little agency subordinating their lives to labour and the power of capital um, in that model, um, which is actually a, a much longer discussion. But it's also a world where power resided in the ability to control the factors of production. And the role of the state was to moderate the excesses of the market. That world has changed forever. If you think about it, in a, an information capitalist world, again to, to quote Zuboff, um, in talking about surveillance, cap surveillance capitalism, she posits that there's a fourth fiction, um, and that reality is subordinated to behaviour mod modification. And in this world, power resides in the ability to control the factors of behaviour modification, in particular consumption. However, I guess the challenging notion here when it comes to the issue of the surveillance state is that the state, far from playing a moderating role, is actually co-opting this surveillance capitalist model to pursue its political agendas with very little opposition. So, you know, and that, that's probably, you know, the, the crux of where I, I suppose I like <laughs> saying, well, we've you know, the state has simply morphed from one role into another, and we've not actually thought about what it's doing in that, in that space. And I guess what accelerates is that, is that along the way, all of these issues around surveillance um, wouldn't, wouldn't work, but for the fact that, you know, while we've, the, the rhetoric over the last 20, 30 years has been around digital transformation of organisations and institutions, really in the last 10 or 15 years, we've all been digitally transformed individually, and no one's really noticed. Um, and no little awareness, and so suddenly our identities now are not just here, there's a whole cloud of stuff, and, and we're now grappling with the fact that 
um, you know, you can harm my digital identity and actually harm me. You know, you can cause me reputational damage. You can call me mental health, call, cause mental health issues. We need to see those. And so it's not just a, it's not benign. And so, you know, in a way, the surveillance state and the surveillance economy really takes little effort because we're, we're already naked. <laughs> and, you know, we've really moved beyond, in my mind, the issue is not about, you know, what size fig leaf or finding a better fig leaf. It's, it, we really have a bigger discussion around um, how do we provide, how do we find a way to exist with a level of dignity and a level of self-determination um, in this kind of space where the conversation is not necessarily around privacy, which is very much an industrial concept, um, but around dignity and our right to dignity and our right to um, autonomy. And in this sort of space, uh, um, there's another academic, Karen Jung, who actually writes another, in, in this sort of context, um, the idea of hypernudge, that if you then take things like nudge theory and behavioral economics, which is all quite discrete, you know, how you, how you write a, a letter or set up a room, to something where you're taking streams of data and actually nudging the population to nudge behaviour one way or another, you start to create this regulation by design. And, um, and how do you govern that and how do you, how do you manage those issues? And I guess RoboDebt is a, is a classic example of, um, of that issue. So where do we go? Um, well, actually, I should actually say, one of, the, one of the really critical things in this discussion is that um, the people that actually suffer most in this, and I alluded to earlier, is that um, the most naked are really the vulnerable and the marginalised, because you know basically all the studies will tell you they're overly they're surveilled more than the rest of us, um, basically because they're on the hook for um, government uh, benefits of one form or another. So they watch. So you see the cashless card. You see, um, you, you know, you see robo debt. Um, you know, issues around New Start where. Um, these people who have got the least amount of agency, the most vulnerable, uh, are in the weakest in, uh, position. And the other space I, I really wanted to call out, and it really um, in terms of that vulnerability becomes, we're mostly not vulnerable, but the one place we are vulnerable is in the civic space. And so the other space, if you see what's going on in Hong Kong, it's that notion of being surveilled if I'm protesting. So who, when I'm out on the street, who's watching me? and who's then tagging me in terms of my, my behaviour and my intent as a result of it. So the question I really get to in the end here is, where does the balancing force come from? You know, such as what the labour movement was, you know, versus capital. You know, where, does, where is that now? And, you know, for, for I suppose the left side of politics, who represents that? It's not labour but it's, it's citizenship. Um, and in my view, there's really three places, four places that this can come from. Um, one, is, as I've mentioned, I think it's how we solve for the margins. Um, in my view, change doesn't come from comfort. And we, the middle, are mostly too comfortable to care <laughs> and not worried enough to act. Um, so it is about how we solve for those groups. Because in a sense, the way we solve for that trickles in to the middle, in my view. I guess the second view, and I, I take um, very much what, what we've seen with the climate strike, is really that, you know, by and large, most of our generation were never really activist. You know, we were the, I can speak for myself, you know, we're sort of the post, you know, um, you know Vietnam protest generation, and we all had a pretty comfortable life um, growing up. But I, I do think that there is a generational change. And so, you know, if I see what I saw on Friday, there's a whole generation of activist young people who, you know, who will find the defining moments in life around what they did on Friday and other days, who will then begin to take that view into other parts of society, then I'm actually hopeful. Um, because they're also the ones that have been born into the information age. You know, their life is on Facebook and social media from, from birth. And so understanding how to live in that space and how to find dignity and how to find um, autonomy in those sort of values is going to be their big challenge in a way that none of us in this room, I would expect, really, truly kind of can appreciate. And I think the other, the other two, I guess, are more suggestions than answers, but I actually think if, and, I've, and I guess I've noticed this in my discussions with, with government around data sharing and, um, and ethics in the last couple of years, and one is, the, what is the role of ultimately, 
who represents the citizens, and so there is a role for civil society, but in a but how does it represent those in a very specific issue around issues like surveillance, and um, and the notion that that you know, and particularly in the context of not surveillance as a horizontal issue, but surveillance in the context of particular government policies and, and regulations, and how they're managed, not on an, an event-driven consultation basis, but on a continuous input basis. Um, and, I, and I think the other part here is, is the role of um, expert groups. And so we're dealing in a space here where um, they're complicated and there's a lot of misinformation and there's a tendency of governments to rely on what I would call the usual suspects and have a very narrow view of um, you know, and, and predominantly technologists looking, you know, who are basically offering technological solutions. But the really hard discussions at that policy level, in my mind, aren't being had, and they're really multidisciplinary discussions. And they're things that are being had in, in Europe. We, you know, we, we're kind of seeing them around data and AI ethics, um, where there are groups of industry, public, private, um, anthropologists, you know, um, philosophers, technologists, the whole range that are coming together to try and develop guidelines um, and approaches. And that's not a, I don't see any of that discussion going on here in Australia. There's a tendency to go point specific to whether it's to Data 61 at CSIRO or to a particular university institute um, looking, you know, to in a sense cherry pick the, the knowledge that they would like to hear. And so without those two moderating voices of both the domain experts and civil society, then I it's very, very difficult for me to see how we can actually progress some of this discussion in a, um, in a meaningful way. I won't leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. And uh, thanks very much to Julia for organising this event and for inviting me here. James has provided a really um, useful and detailed and insightful um, broad picture overview of surveillance. What I'm going to do now is take a much narrower approach um, which focuses on surveillance in the context of big data analytics and in particular their use by political parties to micro-target electors. So small picture but a, an important one and one that's got um, a lot of significance for democracy. Um, so my paper draws on research completed with my colleague Norman Witzleb at Monash University um, and it considers the po political surveillance effects um, of um, political party data collection and the use of that data for, for political advertising. And in case you're interested in pursuing this further, Norman and I have just sent off the final page proofs for a uh, an edited book that um, will be published by Routledge uh, in December this year, uh, which looks at big data, privacy and the political process. And it um, contains papers from an international workshop that we ran on this topic in, in Prato in Italy. So it, it has a number of multidisciplinary perspectives and I think an area like surveillance really calls for that. So political scientists, uh, media studies, philosophers, lawyers from many countries um, commenting on this topic. So um, you've, you've all heard, I'm sure, about big data um, and uh, that's it's already been mentioned by, by James, but it, it, it represents a new frontier in the way that information is processed and used to affect individuals. As James has said, it's not so much the collection, although that raises privacy issues, but it's, it, it's how information is used um, that, that, that can be really, really important or harmful. And what's significant about the big data environment is the, the, the closely allied development of sophisticated analytical tools based on machine learning, artificial <laughs> intelligence, um, which actually are able to leverage these data sets, really vast, vast data sets, which are the, the data that are gathered through all of these surveillance activities that James has been discussing, and to use algorithmic analysis to find small patterns or correlations that reveal new insights or truths or information that previously was unknown or not suspected or couldn't be gleaned. Um, so, um, 
One area where they, they are now increasingly used is in politics. And this follows, of course, from the marketers who have long been using um, the, the, the um, micro-targeting to sell products. So um, the use of electoral databases isn't a new development, as I'm sure you um, would be aware um, political parties have always been gathering information to try and help them to reach their voters. Um, but it's important to really understand the transformative effect of artificial intelligence and big data analytics. So what's significant, as I've said, is not just the size and the complexity of the databases that can now be gathered, and they are really massively ex uh, extensive, uh, but it's also the ability to harness the ability that, that the power of the artificial intelligence to provide new insights into people, the people that you want to reach, um, and how to manipulate them or persuade them to uh, behave in particular ways. And um, James has already sort of um, mentioned that in the, in the context of the nudging. Um, and, and so, um, in terms of the academic analysis, and there's been a lot going on about big data and privacy and artificial intelligence and contexts like the automated government decision making, the criminal decision making, decision making by private entities, for example, about whether people get credit or not. Um, and that's focused very much on issues like due process and issues like discrimination. But the issue of manipulation is only really now being looked at very closely. And as I say, it arises in two contexts. The one, well, in government, as James has said, but also in terms of um, consumer, um, consumer law and um, unfair, potentially unfair trading practices. Um, but as I say, it's um, only with the advent of Cambridge Analytica, the, um, there's been a shift of focus to really look at it in the context of politics. Um, and a specific use of the tool, so, so what this whole um, Cambridge Analytica saga has brought to light is the specific um, use of these tools, which has been facilitated by developments in psychographics, um, and that um, came about through, and you may have heard about it, um, a Facebook privacy breach, essentially, where users in Facebook were asked to um, answer this quiz, um, which was designed to give them feedback about their personality type. Um, but in the course of that, they also gave permission to the researchers to access um, the details of all their friends on Facebook as well, which is sort of pretty amazing. Um, and that was then used by researchers at Cambridge University to um, develop these very um, powerful insights into how you can profile people based on things like their Facebook likes, um, what sort of products, services, etc., you like. Um, and, of course, that um, has immense appeal to political organisations because if you can um, really understand the, person, the, 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 the personality profiles and what drives um, the people you're trying to reach, um, that can be tremendously valuable. Um, and this has happened at a time when people are increasingly, as we all know, using social media. And social media has also played um, an important um, role because it both um, acts as a source of information that's relevant to behavioural targeting. So you can look at what information people post, what their likes are, etc. Um, but also as a mechanism for distribution of messages. And I'll explain the significance of that in a moment. So. Through political micro-targeting, a political party can identify the individual voters whom it's most likely to convince and then match 
individualized messages to the specific interests and vulnerabilities of those voters. Um, and um, as has been illustrated overseas in the context of particularly notoriously the Trump election and the Brexit referendum, um, micro-targeting activities may be accompanied by other practices, including the use of social media bots um, and to spread ideas and information, including fake information. So micro-targeting has increased the efficiency of political campaigning, um, but it raises a number of issues that I think really go to the heart of our democratic systems of government. For example, to what extent do they involve unacceptable manipulation? Do they exacerbate the issue of filter bubbles, thereby undermining some of the inherently collective processes that underpin democratic governance? Um, they also raise quite profound privacy issues. So I would ask to what extent is it acceptable for personal information that's been disclosed um, for other purposes to be repurposed and used in this particular way. Um, and if not, this raises the question, are our regulatory systems sufficiently robust to address this issue? Um, so, um, as, I, as I mentioned, these issues first came to the fore with the so-called Cambridge Analytica um, scandal. And um, I'm actually, in a way, quite grateful for that because it's amazing. Now you just need to say those words and they seem to resonate. People get a sense of what's wrong <laughs> or that there is a serious problem now happening. But basically what happened in March 2018, the New York Times and the Observer revealed that the now defunct uh, data analytics company, Cambridge Analytica, had obtained data from more than 50 million Facebook profiles. Mostly they were from the US, but some of those people were in the US, some in Britain, etc. Um, and um, in its quest to um, to actually develop techniques for predicting and shaping the behaviour of individual American voters. And the relevant research showed that analysis of an individual's Facebook um, likes could predict with a high level of accuracy, a frighteningly um, and quite extraordinarily high level of accuracy, more accurately, in fact, than his or her family or friends, um, that individual's personality, and in particular, it could be used to assess the, the five key traits that are understood as underlying um, personality, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Um, and these events, which Facebook later did acknowledge, constituted a major breach of trust, reveal sufficient, uh, substantial weaknesses in the way that Facebook protects the vast troves of personal information that it collects, and of course it is one of the largest uh, collectors. And um, it also, as I say, um, raised concerns about these practices. And although Cambridge Analytica is no longer exists, uh, it still exists in spirit in a sense, because it's been succeeded by lots of other organisations. Maybe they're slightly more ethical, um, than it was, but their, their intention is very, very similar to use um, uh, psychographics uh, and to combine that with messaging to reach voters. And there's, there's evidence that it's been used in many, many countries, including in Australia. Um, and just to give you an example of the way in which this might happen, um, for example, an individual who has been profiled as being neurotic um, and likes the NRA in the US, the National Rifle Association, they would be targeted with information that um, emphasise law and order type issues. So they'd get lots of media posts telling them about all these home invasions and those sorts of 
things and then um, when the uh, politicians would message those people, they would describe their party as being really strong in terms of law and order. So that would be the picture of, of the party that would be presented to the individual who was profiled in that way. Whereas, for example, someone who liked the NRA but had different characteristics, um, they, might, they might get things about, oh, we're pro-hunting or we encourage uh, shooting as a sport, these sorts of things. So um, that's just one little um, example from, from the US. Um, the other key issue um, that arose in, the con in this context um, was related to the dissemination of the so-called fake news um, and specifically the use of what are called bots um, to flood social networks with false information in order to influence election results. So that, and what was really interesting was that after the Trump election, there was some work done on the Macron election and they found that the same bots had actually been unsold and were operating um, in the context of that election. Um, and the sort of, I can't go into all the technical details, but they were able to actually work out that they were the same bots that were being used. Um, now, the bots can be used to spread false information or just to amplify. So you have all these machines, essentially, that are um, pretending to be um, Twitter, uh, people operating on Twitter or other social network sites. And when, when a message, someone um, tweets a message that is on, that, that, that's consistent with what that party would like uh, to portray, then these bots will, will retweet it and retweet it and retweet it. So it gives the sense that there's a great momentum behind the messages. And, and so people think, oh, lots of people are thinking along those lines, whereas in reality, most of those people are not people, they're machines, they're bots. Um, so the topic of the disinformation, as well as the Cambridge Analytica scandal, uh, have since been the subject of a, a groundbreaking inquiry by the UK House of Commons Digital Culture, Media and Sports Committee. Um, this 18 months long inquiry relied on voluminous evidence from witnesses, submissions, internal documents, etc., um, and collaborated with other domestic and international agencies and organisations. So the report is very, very rich in data and well worth looking at if you're interested in this area. In its final report, the committee found that Facebook intentionally and knowingly violated data privacy and anti-competition laws, um, and it recommended greater regulatory control of social media companies through, through a compulsory code of ethics to be enforced by an independent regulator reforms to electoral communications laws and improved transparency. That was for the UK. Um, and also in the UK, there was a, an extensive inquiry that was um, conducted by the, the privacy regulator, the Information Commissioner's Office. And uh, in fact, they then have since published two reports. The first report was titled Democracy Disrupted, Personal Information and Political Influence. Um, and that contains a, a very detailed account of the findings of the Commissioner. So again, very interesting to look at. And then the second was a report to the UK Parliament that actually summarised the investigations and the enforcement actions that have been taken, which included a fine of £500,000 for Facebook, which sounds like quite a lot of money, but by Facebook standards, not, uh, not, not too much really. Um, and taken together, I think these reports shine a stark light on emerging practices that are now taking place globally, including here. Um, how well micro-targeting works in practice remains a matter of, of controversy. However, it does raise both privacy and security issues. Um, as I've mentioned, it, it, the modern practices undermine privacy because, via the collection and repurposing of information that's been generated for other purposes. 
Um, they also create new security risks, which, which can result in on-flow on harms, such as, for example, um, identity theft and so on. Um, because these vast accumulations of data on voters um, and are now sitting there in political party databases. And in, in Australia, and also in a number of other countries, they're not subject to privacy laws. Um, so, and of course, they're an increasingly attractive honeypot um, of information. Um, but what I want to focus on also are the concerns from a democratic perspective, um, which is really arise from that aspect of manipulation. Manipulative practices, whether in the form of pork barrelling or using emotive language, are by no means new, as you'd all be aware, um, and they've long been tolerated. Um, but I think the practices that I've described have ramped things up significantly and really now justify um, a rethinking about this. Um, one context where there appears to be a strong case for arguing that micro-targeting is harmful is where it's actually used to mislead voters or keep them ignorant about matters relevant to their voting. This has been explained on the basis that a political party could misleadingly present itself as a one-issue party to each individual. So each individual has a differing picture of that party based on the single issue that's likely to be of most interest to them. Um, and um, it can also reduce transparency about a party's promises as voters may, may not even know a party's views on many topics. Um, a further issue relates to the deliberate spreading of false news, um, as I've described. Um, and... Um, I won't go into, I've got some information about um, studies about the use of bots, but I think I'll leave those for now in the interest of time. Um, one, th there's a number of possible regulatory tools that you can use to deal with this issue, but one important one is data protection law, because it, data, data protection laws are the laws that actually can put a break on the process by limiting what's collected and, and how it's then used. In the case of Australia, the relevant law at the federal level is the Privacy Act, um, and this regulates data handling by requiring those, those bodies that are subject to it to comply with a set of APPs, Australian Privacy Principles, that require the fair handling of information. Um, now, that applies to some private sector organisations. Um, however, it's got two e exemptions that have the effect that political parties, their contractors and volunteers, and their acts and practices um, largely fall outside the scope of the Act. Um, they do remain bound by some other laws, including the Electoral Act, um, but not subject to privacy law. So the first exemption operates to exclude political parties registered under the Commonwealth Electoral Act from the scope of the, the, the description of an APP entity. Um, so as a result, political parties are not required to comply with any of the principles. So not just the principles that limit collection and use and disclosure, but they don't have to comply, for example, with security requirements. They don't have to keep the information secure. Um, the second exemption um, does not excludes particular acts and practices from the APP regime. And 7C exempts acts done or practices engaged in for the purposes of an election or a referendum or the participation by the political representative in another aspect of the political process. So very, very broad ranging exclusions from the Act. Um, so, at the time when the private sector um, amendments were introduced into the Act, which broadened its coverage, these exemptions were brought in and they were justified with respect to um, the implied constitutional freedom of political communication um, to Australia's democratic process. 
and the, 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 attorney, the then Attorney General said freedom of pol political communication is vitally important to, to democratic processes in Australia. This exemption is designed to encourage that freedom and enhance the operation of the electoral and political process in Australia. Um, I would dispute that that's the case now. And when the ALRC reviewed the Privacy Act in 2008, it actually looked at this exemption, and that was before um, a lot of these um, additional practices, such as the Cambridge Analytica ones, were known. It, it recommended that these exemptions should be removed. But sadly, like a lot of its other recommendations in that report, that was not given effect to. So as a result, political parties can collect personal data on voters without their consent. There's no right of access to or correction of any data that they hold about you. And there's no transparency, oversight or right of complaint that exists in relation to this. So that means even if the Privacy Commissioner wanted to investigate, they don't have the power to do that. Um, and I think that... Um, these inadequacies alone would be reason enough to subject parties to comply with the same data protection requirements as most other organisations have to. So way back in 2005, Van Onselen and Errington noted that the privacy issues arising from the use of political databases uh, and that such databases weren't subject either to access or amendment provisions and they thought that was pretty bad. Um, they commented that this state of affairs prevented the checks and balances on which had a representative democracy prides itself. The advent of big data and its facility for more precise micro-targeting has arguably considerably worsened this situation, making the case for reform, in my view at least, very much stronger. Thank you.